Hello and welcome to Get Yourself Optimized. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, and today I'm very excited to have Ben Saltzman with us. Ben is an Enneagram expert, igniter of human potential, the coach's coach, an internationally known world-class facilitator, shadow dancer, Fortune 500 leadership trainer, and coach to superior court judges, thought leaders, and iconic change makers. Ben, it's so great to have you on the show. It's good to be here. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Well, first of all, let's talk about the Enneagram because that is such an important aspect to what you do. And many of our listeners probably are unaware of what it is and what power it wields. So let's start there. Yes. Yes. I always feel like on these uh, podcasts, I get to share a little bit of gold with the listeners and and it's in the form of the Enneagram. So this is the Enneagram symbol here behind me. Yeah. And if you for our listener, it, yeah, who doesn't yeah. Uh, have the video going, yeah, yeah, it, why don't you describe it for uh, for for those folks? Yeah, it's basically it's a circle with the nine pointed object inside of it, and it represents uh, nine different types. And the types are the numbers around. If you imagine a clock that goes one through twelve, these numbers go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, with nine at the top. And the reason that there's lines that are connecting these numbers is because there are nine different personality types. And sometimes you move along those lines and take on aspects of the other personality types, not your core point, but you actually move around the symbol. And the, the power of the Enneagram is that it is a very precise map of unconscious motivations. The why you do what you do that you are unaware of. And this means why you sabotage relationships in ways that you're unaware of, why you sabotage your success at work in ways that you're unaware of, uh, why you run away from possibility, from the promotion or the job or the big gig or the big sale. How do we operate in ways that that are unconscious, that are limiting our success? It's a big one. So, so this unconscious uh, behavior, this reminds me a little bit of the print assessment or, yeah, it's just it's an assessment. It's personality assessment. Uh, print allows you to see your unconscious motivators and, and also your triggers. I, I had Deborah Levine, the co-creator of print on this podcast a while back. How does the Enneagram show the unconscious nature of what our behaviors are and what motivates us and all that. Yeah. So I'm going to act out the types in a little bit. So you'll really get a deep dive. I'll, I'll become the nine different personality types and act oh, that'll out. be fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you'll get a, a real feel for the, for the deep dive here. Um, but part of what we find with a lot of the assessment tools is that they map behavior and some of the unconscious drives and motivators, but you're kind of stamped as that type. You know, you, you look in the Myers-Briggs or the DISC and some of these other profiles and they say, well, you're a, you're an XYZ and you're kind of doomed to be that forever. And the underlying principles for the Enneagram is this is a defense mechanism. This is a false self. This is something that you're doing, but it's not the deeper expression of who you are, that there's something that's more authentic, that's more real, that's more powerful, that's more connected. And we can do the work around your type. You can let go of a couple layers of your type and this more authentic, more connected, more powerful you can emerge. And people love that. People are into letting go of this stuff that's been limiting them and coming out into the world. So that's the basic premise of the Enneagram. It comes out of the Eastern philosophies instead of the Western psychology. And with that, you know, that Eastern philosophy is like, we can transform here. Yeah. And and it's not only Eastern philosophy, but it's also, dare I say, quantum physics. Because if you think about the double slit experiment and how light is a wave as well as a particle, a particle, a photon, uh, but not until it's observed by the observer and then it's only a particle, the wave behavior of light disappears. You as the observer are essentially creating your reality, creating what happens in your world. You are collapsing all the infinite possibilities, the wave of potentialities. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. kind of paraphrasing Deepak Chopra here. You're collapsing yeah. all of that wave of potentiality down to one 
characterization, one uh, version or variation of you. Uh, when you do a personality typing or you uh, have a belief about yourself, could be a false belief, you yeah. have collapsed all that infinite possibility down to one. So I'm curious what your, your thoughts are on that. Um, I, I love it that we're already going into quantum physics here. And uh, yeah, I, I think that when we have beliefs about ourselves, it puts us in our own box that we've created on our own. Uh, if you look behind me here, again, people who can't see, I've got the matrix behind me. And if you I'm, remember, I'm a big fan. <laughs> I love yeah, the movie. I love it. I had a feeling. Yeah. So, you know, in the matrix, they were plugged into a false reality. The plug goes into the back of their head. They're, they're hijacked by this false reality that they can't see or taste or touch or smell a prison for their mind. You can think of the Enneagram type in that same way that each type bends reality. It puts like blinders on so we can only see certain things and we can't see other things. We have blind spots that we can't see. Um, so if I'm an Enneagram type six, my attention is pulled towards what are the dangers? What are the hazards? What's going to get me? What's unsafe in the world? And the world that is unsafe shows up in an exaggerated way, clouds my experience, triggers my amygdala. I get to be hyper responsive to anything that's dangerous. Now, this blinders means I can't see what's safe. The way that I can show up for myself, the people who are at my back who are here to support me. So I have this weird tweak, a warp on reality based on my type. And I come to believe it's a dangerous world. Yeah. And so the, you know, through quantum physics, I believe it's a dangerous world. That's what I create over and over and over again. I experience a dangerous world. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm working on a book called The Friendly Universe. And how we live in a friendly universe is, is really the crux of it, because if it, we believe it to be unfriendly, we create that reality. And so much chaos, so much uncertainty, so much destruction, so much mm -hmm. evil, it just mm -hmm. kind of seeks us out, or it just presents itself to us over and over and over again, because that's what we believe uh, the, the universe uh, dishes out. Whereas a friendly universe doesn't look anything like that. It's inherently good, loving. Life happens for us, not mm -hmm. just to us. Life happens by us even better, right? Yeah, so, by us and through us. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I firmly believe that, that, you know, each of these nine types skew reality and create their own weird world. And when we can take those blinders off, and we can see reality as it is, it becomes a much friendlier universe. Yeah, yeah. And so, so let's go through each of those types and maybe you could act out each of those types for us, uh, as, you, as you said earlier, and uh, help us really fully experience what that means, what those blinders yeah. are like. Yeah, yeah. So I'll act them out. And if you have questions, I'll kind of stop before the end and see if there's any questions for you. You know, asking me as the type, I'll answer from inside the type. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. And and I'll do the before transformation and after transformation version of each of the types. Okay. So as we go through. So, so you're talking type. about like there's a shadow version and then there's a fully realized uh, empowered version. Yeah, exactly. They're, they're kind of like, they're on a continuum here and I'll exaggerate the kind of dysfunctional aspects at the before transformation. And then we'll look at after transformation, after they do their inner work, what do they look like? What's the difference? Perfect. Okay, here we go. Uh, I am a type one on the Enneagram. And as a type one, I wanna get things done well. I am precise, I'm called the perfectionist. I have high standards for my own behavior and for other people's behavior. I am constantly scanning my environment for what's out of place, what's wrong. You know, I look at you and I think, oh, I don't know if that shirt really matches your background there, Stefan, and there's some things <laughs> behind you. Uh, I don't know if this is so, so good here. And so the, my attention is always to what's missing and what's out of place. So if you're in relationship with me, whether it's a working relationship or an intimate relationship, as soon as you start feeling criticized, 
you know, we're tight. I'm in with you. I care about you because I'm telling you the real deal. You really do need to shift that or change this or is that is a bad dress or you didn't say that right. So there's this people who are around me often feel criticized or talked down to or I'm the moral uh, authority. And I've got a internal judge, a critic that's going on inside my voice all the time. This voice is saying, you're stupid. You didn't do that right. You need to do this. It, it almost cows me. I'm overwhelmed by it. And this means that I don't take a lot of risks. I'm kind of rigid in the business uh, arena. My creativity is stifled. I'm kind of doing the right thing, whatever right is. Uh, so any questions for me uh, as a type one? Okay, Work. so so being a perfectionist, I've heard this before, is uh, having such high standards that it's equivalent to having no standards at all because you don't get anything done. Yes, I often don't get anything done because I want to do it so perfectly. So I, I redo the presentation. I, I stew about what, what am I going to say on the call. I'm, there's just like an on can't get it done right and so things never launch things never happen you know it's yeah. like my, my, my own worst enemy yeah yeah perfect is the enemy of done <laughs> yes exactly yeah. right and is there a lot of rumination going on like stuff just going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth in your head like you're just stewing on stuff yeah particularly i stew if somebody has done something to me hmm. and there's resentment in here and there's a grinding irritation, you know, I'm like, oh, that, that it's in my chaw, you know, like I can't get rid of it. Got it. Okay. All right. Good. All right. So that's a pre-transformation. So then we go through the transformation and now I am an Enneagram type one after transformation. I've done my inner work, learned some relational skills. What I've discovered is that there's more acceptance. There's more acceptance of me, of my flaws, of what's going on inside here. There's more acceptance of you. I've kind of loosened up. There's more joy running through me. There's more lightness in my being. People who are around me don't feel so criticized. They actually feel supported. My creativity has come more online because I'm not so worried about getting it right. I can kind of break out of the box. And there's a part of you that can enjoy being around me and with me. Uh, there's just kind of more ease in my system. Can you get a feel for it here? Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot lighter. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's a lot lighter, yeah. My, my friends are tell me things like, God, I feel more relaxed around you. And I want to, you know, in the business world, people want to collaborate more with me because there, there's just more ease and juice there. Yeah, but there's still attention to detail and precision there. It's just yes. a more realized, uh, more elevated version. Yes, exactly. I, I'm not sloughing things off. People would never call me, you know, a slacker. I still get things done and I'm precise. I'm just much less rigid about it. Yeah. Great. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, nice to meet you, type number one. <laughs> yes, thank you. Moving on to type number two now, which we call the helper. So I'm a type two on the Enneagram. And something that I want to tell you is that I'm a good friend. I love to love. I love to support. I'm in support of other people. I am constantly going out of my way to create connection. And I'm attuned to what are your needs? What are your desires? What do you want? And that means that I can't see my own desires. I can't see what's needed over here. So my own agenda gets lost and I end up helping you and helping you and helping you. I can almost become a different person to help you and to support your needs. And when this gets cranked up into overdrive, I'm depleted. I'm like, I've helped so many people, I'm exhausted. I get a nervous breakdown or I feel horrendous. You know, I'm like, when is it my chance? How come you can't help me? What, where's the coming back? Like the helping is supposed to be reciprocal. Don't you get the game? I help you and I overhelp and then you help me. And when that doesn't happen, 
I start to get resentful. I start to get angry, um, kind of get burned out over time. Uh, there's something inside me that's like, how come you don't value me? And the truth is, I'm not valuing me. Underneath all this, I think I have to sing for my supper. I think I have to earn attention or love by doing. And it is exhausting tracking everybody else's needs and desires and not knowing my own. Hmm. Any questions for me as a type two? Yes. Uh, so you've heard the old adage, uh, put your own oxygen mask on first. <laughs> yes. So why don't you heed that advice? Every plane ride, you get that advice. Why don't you, why don't you implement it? You know, that's a nice theory, buddy. But <laughs> when you don't know where the oxygen mask is, it doesn't occur to you. It's like, I don't even know what that would look like. I can hold the intention of attending to my own needs first, but there's no, like, what, how, what would I, I don't know what I want. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I need. So there's a, a real kind of blind spot there before transformation. It's like, I'm thirsty and I get you a glass of water. Right, right, right. So do you identify as a martyr? Yes, I can be a martyr, a victim a doormat. Um, sometimes people tell me things like, uh, I feel like I'm caught in your web and I owe you something, but I don't really know why I didn't ask for all your help. You know, right. there's, like there's a law of reciprocity. And like this was a interesting study from the uh, written up in the book Influence by Robert Cialdini, who was a guest on this podcast, a great, great episode. Uh, yeah. the Hare Krishnas would give uh, flowers to people and, and people would go out of their way to not get the flower. They would walk around the area, like they'd go out of the square and like across the street or whatever to get yeah. away from the Hare Krishna giving the flower away so they didn't have to take the flower because then there's that yeah. law of reciprocity <laughs> kicks in and then they're like... Okay, I guess I have to give you money. I don't want to, but you just gave me a flower. And that's uh, that yes. social pressure is extreme. Yes. As, as an unevolved type two, I am those Hare Krishna people. <laughs> giving things, expecting return. I, I don't even know it sometimes that there's a manipulation involved. Like when I first discovered my type and Ben Saltzman told me that I was manipulating people, I did not like hearing that. Yeah. Was, and Not you didn't in, see it. You didn't see it because I, it, it was a blind spot. Yeah, it was, I was totally blind to it. And when I discovered it, I was not pleased with myself. With, with, uh, and that led to the transformation. So okay. let's, let's do the, the transformation for the type two. Let's do it. So I am transformed to type two. And what I've noticed is that my sense of self, self-value and self-worth has gone up. I now know what my desires are, what my own needs are. I'm thirsty, I get me a glass of water. I take time out for me. I actually charge what I'm worth for my services. Uh, I respect my own time in relationships. Instead of making you lunch and dinner and breakfast and, you know, wanting to give you a foot massage all the time, what, you know, like instead of the constant giving, I'm replenishing myself so that I can come fully loaded to the table. And it feels good over here. Uh, I've got my time back. I've got my income up. I've got my friends in place. Um, people aren't avoiding me <laughs> because of that weird giving thing. People feel like, oh, I can be in a relationship and you can take care of yourself. And that's huge. I, it feels like my relationships are clean now. They're not so messy. And I've learned to set boundaries, limits. I used to think of those as ugly things that would separate us. Like a boundary would be something that would create distance between us and it would almost send me into a panic before transformation. Now, if I, you know, it's not okay to treat me that way or no, I don't want to go to that dinner the way you want to go. Like I can kind of claim my truth and I'm still okay. The The world's not going to end. The relationship's not going to end. Mm. This, uh, uh, makes me think of Atlas and having the whole world on his shoulders and somebody mm -hmm. who's type two unevolved 
probably feels that way. Like if I don't do it, then who's going to do it? I'm always rescuing, saving, mm -hmm. uh, doing for others and there's yeah. nothing left and I'm exhausted and I'm going to collapse. Exactly. You got it. Yeah. Now, this this was an interesting lesson I learned relating to the the helper and trying to bring everybody else up the mountain is yeah. I had a session with Eric Lures, who you may know from JVMM because that's how we met. Uh, yeah. Really great guy. I didn't know he was psychic. I just uh, had a session with him and he started channeling and just sharing right off the bat. It was like, I'm getting this big like vision uh, that I need to share with you, this, this picture of a mountain and there are these lines uh, going down the mountain, only halfway down the mountain. So it's like these lines represent you uh, putting stakes in the mountain uh, rock face, hammering those in vertical or uh, uh, horizontally, laterally across the mountain, trying to bring everybody up to where you are halfway up the mountain. That's not how it's supposed to work. You're supposed to go up to the top of the mountain and you're wasting all of your resources, time, energy, focus, getting everybody else up to where you're at and also uh, focusing on the middle of the mountain when all the action is up at the top of the mountain. Mm. So that, mm -hmm. I really, that, that resonated for me, that really uh, struck a, a chord and I knew that was something that he had, I knew he had channeled that, that came from higher dimension and i finally got it i had yes i understood conceptually beforehand how i'm spread across too many different things how i have way too many to do's and my to-do list and so forth and so on i read the the one thing book by gary keller and so forth yeah. i got it all conceptually but yeah. I, I wasn't putting it into practice, not until I had that session with Eric. And by the way, that the episode where I interviewed Eric, I go into more detail about this whole thing, and he goes more into his psychic abilities as well as business applicability and because uh, he's a business coach and, and uh, executive coach, and he's phenomenal. I don't, I, have you ever talked to Eric before? No, I haven't met him, but I've heard of him. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's fantastic. I recommend him. So anyways, listener definitely check out the Eric Lures episode. So now let's move on to type three. Yes, type three. So I am now a pre-transformation type three. And something that I want you to know about me is I get stuff done and I look good doing it. There's a little bit of like, check me out here. I, I get the best grades. I push for the, the top of the class. I push for the top of the economic spectrum. Like any social group that I'm in, I'm looking for who is the best here? What is the archetype that is the highest ideal? And I can become that person. I can become that archetype. I can shape shift and wear the right clothes, use the right language, use the right words to basically become that ideal. And there are people who say, well, who are you? because you, it's all image, it's mm -hmm. like smoke and mirrors. Yeah. And behind the scenes, I'm like, don't look, you know, this is the Wizard of Oz kind of feeling. Don't look mm -hmm. at the man behind the curtain, just pay attention to the image, to like what I'm presenting. And I'm going and I'm going, the pace of my life is, because I really value being seen as successful and achieving, the pace of my life is intense. I'm going, I'm pushing, I'm hard driving. I don't, you know, sometimes I don't feed my body. Sometimes I don't worry about any of my emotional needs or whatever. I'm just like, do it, make it happen. You know, like I, the ideal, the American ideal, success by driving you know, is like, that is my motto. And what this means is I tend to burn out. I, I go so far that I hit a wall and then my world falls apart. And that's when I kind of started getting into personal development is when I had a nervous breakdown and you know I got cancer and just all the doing and not paying attention to the being uh, was hard for me. 
uh, my, my spiritual development really went into higher gear when, when I broke down. Now, when the people that I care about are around me, sometimes they can't feel who I am. They're like, you at, you're this way for this group, you're this way for this group, you're always running around. I never get to be with you. I, I feel like I'm kind of tracking a ghost because you're always on the move because you're doing the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. So it's it's pretty hard for me to slow down and smell the roses and, and be with life. Any yeah. questions for me, uh, pre-transformation yeah. three? Yeah, yeah. So uh, do you know your authentic self? That word doesn't even make any sense to me. Mm. Like, I don't, all I know is I show you this and this looks good. That From that angle, I looks good. Okay, I'll, sh I'll show you that angle of me. Okay. Yeah. Like, it's, this, is the, this is the good side of my face for taking photos. <laughs> okay. Yes. All right. Yes. That is, I am constantly attuned to that. Okay. And I don't, it's like on the edge of my consciousness that I'm being deceptive. Right. So you're not totally aware it's not in in your prefrontal cortex that you're wearing different masks all the time right yeah i it's just i'm just showing you what you need yeah. to see yeah and part of wearing these masks is to fit the part with uh with all the trappings of success for that particular part that you're playing so uh right. having the rolex watch or the 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 right kind of car and being in the right kind of neighborhood, right kind of school district, all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. is is part of the equation for you. Is that right? Exactly. Like that that's it's all about how I'm perceived and am I achieving. Okay. So the Millionaire Next Door book would be a fantastic <laughs> book for the pre transformation uh type three then. Yeah. Are you familiar it's, with that book? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Great great book. Read it yeah. several decades ago. <laughs> Yeah. Um, all right. I think I should transform now, huh? Let's do it. Okay. So I'm a transformed type three. And what I have discovered through that inner journey is that there is an authentic self here. That there is a part of me that isn't all about performance, um, but that I can actually slow down and be with people. And I enjoy them more. And that authentic me, I had to go find it. I had to slow down. I had to find my emotional body. And, you know, there was a lot of tears that were shed as I kind of was with all the stuff that I had shoved away before. There's a way that I am in the world that other people can feel me more now. And I know me more now. So I'm not so um, panicked about going and racing and doing and achieving it's like i slowed down and i like me more and other people like me more get a feel for it got it okay yeah, yeah. all right let's do four huh yep enneagram type four pre-transformation i am the romantic the tragic romantic sometimes i'm called uh, I'm now in my heart center in a big way, and I get exaggerated emotions. I do high highs and low lows. Uh, there's a part of me that feels elation and the joy of life, and I can get into depression and melancholy and the, oh, the angst of life. Um, underneath, I've got this belief that there's something broken inside me some fundamental flaw and I've been left. And so when anybody turns their back on me, I feel rejected. Anybody looks at me weird and I go, oh, what are you seeing inside of me? Often I feel like an alien. Like the, the rest of you kind of connect and are accepting of each other, but I'm, I'm on the outside and I'm dark. You know, I was goth i was black fingernails and dark clothing and those kinds of things i have a huge flair for creativity 
uh, and my emotion means that I'm a great actor and actress. And a lot of my fellow fours are in the movies, you know, and they really feel into the characters and what's going on for them. But there is a tragic sense to it. There is a, like, um, untouchable, unlovable. Mm, unreachable? Unreachable. Yet desperate for you to see me like so wanting to be seen and validated and mm, i don't know if if you get too close you're gonna see the flaw so i pull back but i, but I want to be connected but you know so there's this push pull in relationship mm. any any questions for me as a pre-transformation type four so does it feel like emotional distancing that you're uh, putting out there or does it feel like uh, just pure rejection by others it feels from over here that I'm rejected and that you don't really care okay got it yeah, yeah then I'm on the outside can I transform please yes <laughs> okay beautiful I am a transformed type four and whoo the world is lighter now. I did my inner emotional and spiritual work. I learned how to connect with people. I now feel more valuable. I feel like I matter more. I have this sense that um, of inner wholeness. And what this means in relationship is that I can meet you, that I can feel worthy of your time, your energy, your care, your love. And that um, in the business world, I can charge more for my services because my sense of I'm okay in the world and I'm not rejected is a lot higher. And when I feel like I'm more whole and I'm not more rejected and rejectable, I can create more connection. I can open. And all those creative gifts that I've been hiding in the closet, they can come out. So I'm way more expressed now. I'm doing poetry, I'm painting, I'm bringing my gifts out to the world. And it is a world that receives me because I feel worthy to be received. Mm, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> That's good news, huh? Great. Uh, let's go to type five. All right. Enneagram type five. And now we're getting up into the head types, five, six, and seven, all based up in the head. And I'm um, pre-transformation, Enneagram type five. I think through life. I think through the world. Think of Spock. Is it logical? Can I be understood? Um, because I'm not connected to the heart and the body, I'm kind of like a walking head on a stick. And people kind of relate to me as a brain. Uh, and I can feel intellectually superior and a little bit... Um, put off by those of you who have all those messy emotions and are crying all the time and want things from me. I'm kind of reclusive. I'm, I'm a little bit um, overwhelmed by humans with all of your needs and emotions and desires and what's going on out there. I'm kind of like, ah, you want too much from me. And so people can exper experience me as standoffish, as removed, as intellectually superior, as uh, kind of disconnected from life. And frankly, a lot of the times I'd rather be at my home or studying or reading than forced to be around groups of people all the time where I feel a little bit socially inept. You know, I remember once trying to be social with a woman and I said, well, that's a really nice dress. Did you make it yourself? And she was offended. And I have no idea why, but it's that kind of thing over and over where I kind of stumble socially and put my foot in my mouth. That, that actually sounds like a, a neg, which is uh, one of the tactics that uh, that pickup artists use. <laughs> <laughs> like it's a backhanded compliment and it is uh, they use it on uh, the, like the supermodels who think that they're untouchable and uh -huh. it just kind of, I guess, puts them in their place a little bit or makes them... Uh, puts them a little off kilter and so yeah. uh yeah I, I never liked that that idea of of using a neg as a, a way to pick up a woman but i just uh that, that's what it came to my mind when you were talking about uh, yeah about that okay so that's not 
uh, a great place to be. Uh, um, again, that seems pretty emotionally unavailable and dry. Yeah, just unapproachable. Mm -hmm. But it's different from the, the the type four romantic because they are less wearing their heart on their sleeve in a way like uh, obvious it's pretty obvious if you see someone in in uh kind of a goth outfit that hey i'm <laughs> letting the world know i'm not ashamed of this that <laughs> this is my my worldview whereas a type five uh, it seems like they try to hide a bit more is that yeah. right yeah yes i would say so the, the the fives are usually more reluctant to share themselves, their information, their energy, their time, uh, and definitely don't have their emotions on their sleeves. Yeah. Whereas the, the four is a lot more emotion avail emotional availability, a lot more self-expression. They're like, I've got to express or I'm going to die is going on inside the fours. Okay, got it. All right, so let's transform type five. Okay, transform to type five. So uh, I go through that the transformational journey, and I've dropped from the head into the heart and into the body. Huge transformation. Uh, I've discovered that as I dropped in here, I actually like people, and I like being in relationship with them. And it's not that I've become a crazy extrovert and want to be around people all the time, um, but there is more of availability inside me. I'm more open to share. Uh, I'm more open to be with people. I'm more interested in them. Uh, I'm not so socially in adept now. I've got, you know, I learned some social skills. And um, th this means that people feel me more and can relate to me more. And that means that my social circle has increased. I've got more friends. And it means that I've learned how to play the game at work a little bit more. So I got a, a promotion and people relate to me as a leader at work. Um, so that, those are pretty big shifts for me. Awesome. Yeah, definitely to be more relatable and uh, more in your body is uh, something we, sh we should all aspire towards. <laughs> yeah, this, this has been a beautiful journey for me. Okay, awesome. Let's go to type six. Six. All right. Pre-transformation, type six. And... I am what they call the skeptic or the loyal skeptic here as a type six. And we talked a little about this earlier in the podcast. I live in a world where there's a lot of dangers and hazards where I'm kind of looking for what's the hidden agenda. Are you out to get me? What are you going to do? Uh, particularly if you are an authority figure, I don't trust you. I don't think that you're looking out for my best interest. Um, and when I'm in relationship, I'm always looking for evidence that you're going to leave me or that you don't care about me because that's some of my worst fears. And because I'm looking for evidence of it, I remember I, I bumped into an ex-girlfriend a couple of years after we broke up and she says, well, you know, why did you break up with me? And I was like, well, I didn't break up with you. You broke up with me. And she said, you pushed me away. You, you didn't respond to me. And I had seen evidence that was letting me know that she was distancing from me because I was looking for evidence of her leaving me. I saw it, but she didn't leave me. I actually created the thing that I was the most afraid of. Mm. So, so I distanced from her and then the relationship was over. Wow. So, so you know, f fear is false evidence appearing real. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, and and it it's all around me. False evidence appearing real is around me all the time. So it's got me living a smaller life, not taking many risks, kind of doing what I have to do to s stay safe. Sometimes I can feel a little paranoid before transformation. Uh, it's it's a tough place to be. Mm world is a scary place. All right, so let's transform. All right, so I go through my transformational journey. And after transformation, I have found my inner authority, my inner sense of I'm okay. And the world uh, appears as more safe. I've discovered that I can show up for me. And that's a big part of my transformation is I can rely on me here to be solid, to be true, to be truthful, to be confident. And that means that I can now bring myself out to a world that supports me in ways that I had no idea 
was available. It's become a friendlier world. Now, it's not that my mind doesn't go towards the future and what might go wrong, and I do a lot of worst-case scenario imagining. I still do some of that. I just do it less, and I don't believe it as much. I'm I'm just not in that world. Mm. Now, if if you're watching, you might be going, well, which one of these nine types am I? And so we've got an online test that you can take the the online test. Um, So if you, you know, if you're, because sometimes when people hear these types, they're, I'm this one, no, I'm that one, no, I'm this one, you know, they they kind of go through that. Um, So we do have an online test. And I don't know, we'll get you a link or something. I don't know how we're going to get that out to people. But yeah, we'll include it in the show notes for this episode. And so then our listener will be able to get it there. Yep. Great. And and you can go to touchedandtransformed.com too. There's a, you can get it at the website. Perfect. Um, so that's type six, type seven. Yep. Let's go to type seven. All right. Type seven. As a seven, something that I want you to know is I do joy really well. And I do lightness and humor really well. There's a lot of comedians that are type sevens. And I've got this uh, belief that's down there, it's unconscious, that if I'm forced to experience pain or suffering, I'm going to die. Like, that's the core belief. Each type has a core belief at the bottom that's really unconscious and pushing things around. And for the seven, if I experience pain and suffering and I'm forced to, I'm going to die. So this means that I'm moving towards lightness. I'm keeping my options open. I'm bouncing from one relationship to the next, from one job to the next sometimes. Or geographically, I'm moving from one country to the next. And it's always on to the next, on to the next, on to the next. And you know, people can kind of experience me as a little surface level. It's a little bit like I'm lacking depth. Uh, a little bit like the dilettante that dabbles in all these things and never gets to mastery because my pace is fast and there's always another shiny object anything not to feel limited i didn't do my taxes for 10 years because they were so boring it was so limiting it was like oh just didn't have forced me to sit down and do this thing it just feels horrendous um and it, it, it also means that in jobs i don't get the payoff because I don't go into depth and really master the whatever my career is. I bounce from one career to the next. I, I don't get paid what I'm worth. I, I kind of feel like, hmm, I'm, I'm just not there. Any questions for me as a pre-transformation seven? So you're not doing the hard yards? I'm not doing the hard yards. Okay. All right. And Follow- is uh, Robin Williams somebody who would have been uh, a type seven? Yeah. Yes, I think Robin Williams is a seven. Because hmm. he, he he battled depression and he had a really hard time with uh, his inner world. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you can feel the agile mind in Robin Williams. Yeah. For, for the sevens, we've got that agile, quick mind, quick thinking, a lot of humor. Hmm. Okay, let's transform. All right. So I am a transformed type seven, and as I transformed, I found my ground. I found my inner sense of I'm okay, even if I'm limited. That was huge. So I learned how to commit. So I committed and I got married. That's a commitment. I had a kid, huge commitment. Now I'm tied to that kid for the rest of that kid's life. Before I did my inner work, there was no way I was going there. Because inside of our psyche, inside of our soul, we know as we commit to another human, as we get more connected, at some point, there's going to be pain. They're going to get hurt. They're going to get injured. Somebody's going to die. Something might happen. And I have developed the capacity to be with that pain, to be with that sadness, to be with suffering. And it means that I can be with my own. It means I can be with yours. Uh, I, I coach, and so people can do more depth work with me. People tell me things like, man, you're, you've got more ground. You've got more depth. Like, I feel like I can be held by you in, in a way that they couldn't before. Mm, like hold space for somebody. Yes, exactly. My capacity to hold space for other people is broad and deep now. 
Wonderful. All right, let's go to type eight. Okay, type eight on the Enneagram. I'm the boss. I am the controller. I am the one that makes things happen as an eight. I'm big. People can uh, experience me as overly aggressive. I don't really care about that very much. Um, I'm kind of pushing the world around and you better listen up because we got stuff to do here and the rest of you are kind of playing at half speed. And I'm like, wake up, people. We got work to do. We got a planet to save. We got things to do. So there's a drive. There's an intensity inside of me as a type eight. And most of the world is going, whoa, you're too much. You're too big. You're too angry. And I'm like, I'm just doing being me. You Get a backbone. Come on. You know, it's like that kind of experience for me. And the world often feels small and like the rest of you are kind of ants in my playground and chess pieces that I move around my board and uh, it can be lonely for me as an eight feeling like I'm the only one who has this much um, belief and intensity and drive and focus you know I'm, 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 I'm often overwhelming to other people and I don't know how intense I am I, I, there's no internal Geiger counter for my intensity. So there's sometimes when I go, oh, sorry, because I do have a big heart, but it's on the inside. Sometimes they refer to me as a burnt marshmallow, kind of <laughs> crusty and aggressive on the outside and kind of gooey, warm, big heart on the inside. <laughs> okay. So would you refer to your team as your minions? Yes, that is that has happened in the past. There's been times when I've been driving to the top of the hill. Go, oh, come on, we're gonna make it. And I turn back. And there's all these dead bodies behind me, and I'm, I didn't mean to. Oops, sorry. Um, but sometimes they they can feel like I just don't care about them. It's it's just all about accomplishing and power. Yeah. So HR really is about managing human assets. <laughs> yes, yes. People get reduced to assets sometimes, yeah. unless they're in my inner circle. Like when you're in my inner circle, I will go to the mat for you. I will kill for you. There's a mob boss kind of mentality here of you mess with my people, I take you out. <laughs> okay, got that it. Kind of, like I know that feeling inside of me of I'm the protector. Okay. All right. Well, let's transform. All right. Transform type eight. Uh, I, I do my inner work and that marshmallow of the gooey inside and the crusty outside, they've, they've kind of melded more. So I can now attune to the people in my life. I've opened to my own vulnerability and to others. I've kind of gone through a transformational journey and I'm not as overwhelming. Uh, I'm not as scary to people. Uh, I can see when their hair is like getting blown back from my voice and I actually say, oh, there's a human there. I relate to you as another human, as a soul in a body, not as something that gets objectified or pisses me off or that I have to move around uh, and I find that people stay in my life more and I have more connection and people are not as afraid I like that mm, a soul and a body I like that so you can see the spark of God in everyone exactly yeah your humanity and your divinity is more available to me amazing all right let's go to type nine all right, up to the very top of the Enneagram, if you all remember that the, the type nine is at the top of the symbol. And from this vantage point at the top, I see everyone else. I see what's going on for them. And I lose myself. I lose who I am in everyone else. So I can take on their personality, their agenda, their characteristics. Uh, there's something inside of me that f feels fear about going after what I want with too much drive, with too much focus. Um, I tend to be conflict avoidant. I don't like anger. There's something inside of me that really just, can't we all just go along to get along? Like, can't, let's just play nice together. Come on. 
And um, be, because I am afraid of creating distance between me and others, my energy just merges with other people. And when it's time for me to take action, when it was time for me to make that call to get the promotion, to get the big job, all of a sudden polishing the doorknob felt really important. <laughs> and picking up my room and all the clothes in my room just like, like it drew me. So my attention is drawn towards inessentials when it's time for me to take action on my own behalf. Mm. Very like a low sense of self-worth. So I don't charge what I'm worth. I don't really go after what my thing is, my desires are. I, I, I just, I don't want to ruffle feathers. Okay, let's transform. All right, as a transformed five, I have discovered that I have needs and desires and that I matter. I'm not invisible anymore. I can speak my truth. I can go after the thing that I want. I charge more for my services and guess what? People pay it. Like they want to work with me. I had no idea how many people actually wanted to work with me. Now that I have an increased sense of self value, they value me in a higher way. And that's nice for me. That's what I really want in the world. I want to be seen. I want to be expressed. I want to have something in my soul that like I matter. It's like I found my inner authority. And the, the world opened at my feet. Hmm, amazing. All right. Well, so let's say that our listener takes the online test and they've identified that they, they're a type whatever, right? five or whatever. But that's, yeah. that's their primary and then they have a secondary or that's the only type that they're assigned. And uh, like how, how does, well, walk us briefly through this process. How long does this test take? What's the yeah. cost? What do you get as the output? Yeah. So typically what happens is you take the test, five minutes, it's free test, and then you get dropped onto a page with a video about your type. So you get to you kind of get some a deeper understanding of what your type is and what's going on there. And for some people, that's enough. Just kind of having some self-awareness is, is enough for them. But for a lot of us, there's this, well, how do I, what do I do about that? How do I change? And how do I transform? And for, for those of you who are into that, we have online programs where you get to go through, transform your type is the online program. And we have a six month program, which is called Relational Mastery. And in that program, it's the deep dive that you're learning relational skills. You're going through your own transformational journey with a cohort of 14 people. You're, you're deep diving into your own, you know, the evolution of your spirit, the evolution of your soul. And how do I form deeper connected relationships with other people? Mm. So you've identified through this process, uh, taking this online training, what your core beliefs are as that type and how to transform those core beliefs into things that are more empowering and uh, helpful. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and you can think of it, you know, if we look from the spiritual perspective, you can think of it like that false self is starting to let go. And that authentic self, that higher self, that divine self is starting to come through. So we find that people uh, the way that they actually show up in the world changes, that they show up with more inner authority, more connection, more presence, more personal power. Like there's these qualities that are wanting to come through. And as your type starts to let go, they can. And, and that's part of the transformation. That's why we call this spiritual transformation is because it's not just kind of ideas and beliefs. It's like a full experience of shift. Yeah. Yeah, in India, I learned that the divine is not a belief, but an experience. And I got to experience what that meant because I was agnostic. And then I got a, a, a diksha, a oneness blessing. A monk touched me on the head and uh, it was like an LSD trip of some sort. <laughs> I, I, I was uh, forever changed uh, from that experience. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that... You know, that's what we became really interested in is how do we help people to get that forever changed experience? And it's really been 20 years of us finding 
what are the best methods. We use shadow work. We use precise self-observation practices. We use self-inquiry. There's a lot of practices that we've rolled into our programs so that we can have that forever changed, kind of opened to new spaces uh, experience for people. Amazing. All right. So if somebody wanted to take a transformation journey on their own is there a book or a resource or something that you would recommend was there something perhaps that was particularly powerful for you a a book a mentor a training or something that uh, launched you on your journey yeah i i get people usually discover themselves in a deeper way when they watch an enneagram panel So a panel is three or four people, all of the same type, and a facilitator is taking that group into self-exploration. So let's say they're all type sixes. That type six is revealed on this panel in huge depth. And um, when I run panels or other facilitators run panels, we're intentionally pulling them down into their core fears, the stuff that agitates their soul, and they can you can feel them starting to twitch. And it often to me feels like tuning forks. As one of them starts to twitch, it lights the other one up, that lights the other one up. And so everybody is twitching with that for the sixes, that core fear, like ah! and if you're a six, you get activated. That that tuning fork impacts you. And as you see your particular panel, and you can you can check these out on YouTube. There's free panels. We've got a good set of panels at our website. Um, that, but watching panels is by far the best way to discover your type uh, at depth and to start that journey of transformation. Like there, it, it'll it'll get you going. Beautiful. All right. So remind us again, what is the name of the program that you offer that? Uh, helps people through that transformation process and also uh, the location of the online test. So the online uh, program is called Transform Your Type for Relationships. That's a, that's the online version. The Deeper Dive, the six-month program, is called Relational Mastery. That's if you really want to go into the deep waters with us. And the test can be found at touchedandtransformed.com. And if you look at the top and it says free test, that's where you want to go. Okay, awesome. And we'll include all this in the show notes, uh, listeners. So that's another way to get to it if you're driving or working out at the gym. Thank you so much, Ben. This was fabulous and insightful. And, And I loved the way that you helped us to really understand the nine types of the Enneagram and relate to them as as real people, both the version pre- before transformation and after. So thank you for that. Yeah, my, my pleasure. And thank you for your questions. Uh, uh, your, your engagement helps me bring the types alive for people. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, and you listener, if you re- relate to any of what you've heard in this episode, please dig deeper, take the test, figure out what your type is and work on it to be the best, most evolved and elevated version of yourself as possible. And we'll catch you in the next episode. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off.